All right. Welcome, everyone, to a new episode of the Roscoe's Wetsuit Podcast. Today on the show, I have a very special guest. We have Zan Perion on the show. Zan is an inter uh, he's internationally recognized as one of the most original and insightful voices on relationships and seduction in the world today. A regular media commentator, he has been widely featured in the international press. Zan is the founder of the Ars Amorata philosophy, a celebration of the art of seduction, the rebirth of romance, and a lifelong quest for beauty and adventure. He is also a co-founder of the Amorati Network of Men. Zan, I could go on, but I'm so glad, uh, you know, to have you on the show. Um, you know, when I, when I originally started the show, actually in the bio, uh, you know, I wrote, I wanted to do this as a raw, you know, raw, unfiltered interviews um, with people that I really admire. And, mm -hmm. you know, if I, uh, you know, from what I've seen from you, raw and unfiltered seems to, <laughs> seems to be pretty apt. You, you seem I'm pretty raw there. and pretty unfiltered. Yeah. Right. On. <laughs> pretty much both those. Right yeah. on. Well, so glad to have you on the show today. Uh, thank um, you for having me, man. Absolutely. So I wanted to kind of, you know, for our listeners who, who may not kind of know your story, can you briefly kind of uh, describe, because you've had a, a really interesting upbringing, right? And as mm. far as growing up in, uh, in Canada, growing Canada, up in the yeah. wilderness, can, can you kind of, kind of tell me a little about your, your story kind of growing up? Well, we were quite poor when I was a, a kid in Northern Canada, Northwestern Canada, in British Columbia. And, uh, um, long story, very short. I, I essentially left home at 13 years old and, uh, in other words, I left school as well at 13. My formal education ended at 13 and I kind of lived in the wilderness for my teen years and, you know, with moccasins and, you know, kind of a, no electricity, no running water, chopping a lot of wood. I chopped wood every day for years. <laughs> And, um, and when I was 19 or so, 18, 19, that age, I came out of the forest because there was no girls there. And, uh, so I, and I, I tried to assimilate myself into the, into the normalities of the world, but I had a lot of shame because I, I had a poverty mentality and I'd never known anything that was, you know, any, any kind of money. And I had no education. I was ashamed of that too. So I started to really fake my way through life. And all through my 20s, I was, you know, very insecure and very faking it. And yeah, so I mean, like, my 20s was a mess of insecurities and petty pettiness and jealousies, jealousies and neediness and uh, with women. And at the at parallel track to that as I, as I educated myself with books, basically literature and because I didn't have an education and I worked my way up in the corporate world. So I had two parallel tracks. So I was, I became a corporate guy with a suit and on the weekends and evenings, I would go prowling around trying to meet girls. <laughs> so that was my whole story for a lot of years. And then, um, around, well, when I turned, when I turned 40, I started, I, I, I left, I left the corporate world and I hit the road and I started to write a book called the Alabaster girl, which took me 10 years to write. And, uh, uh, and as I traveled, I traveled the world basically with a carry on suitcase only. I left all that, you know, I went back to basically to the forest that I, that I grew up in metaphorically went back to the simplicity of just having you know moccasins and a and a kerosene lamp and a journal to write in and i replicated that but i was now in the cities of the world so i had simplicity i had to carry on bag one pair of shoes uh no possessions other than that that was in that bag and i spent those years traveling talking uh sharing my experiences my stories and writing the book so that's my long-winded short story right right and i actually wanted to to touch on that as far as you know i know you mentioned i think in your book 
as far as kind of your, you know, your 20s kind of making all of these mistakes, you know, sort mm -hmm. of in the land of women, your 30s kind of starting to starting to figure it out, the the synapses starting to fire. <laughs> and then, and then in the 40, in your 40s, kind of writing this, this book, this uh, yeah. know, book, by the way, I recommend it to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. I read it like three times. So I always get something <laughs> new. Um, but tell me a little kind of, you know, when you look back, you know, on your 20s, you know, and then kind of the progression throughout your life, what, what's changed? What, how, you know, how, how have you changed as far as your mm. interactions with, with the world and, you know, women in particular? Oh, well, I, I, because I was so driven and felt so insecure in my, in my early years, I, I went down that path. You have to have a, a nice car and a nice boat and a nice motorcycle and a nice apartment with the right lighting, the right stereo for women to notice you or, or be attracted to you. And I went down that path in a heavy way. I got myself heavily in debt, bought a nice apartment. You know, like I said, I worked my way up in the corporate world, but in Canada, maybe not, maybe the States too, but certainly in Canada, it's, it's the, it's built on debt, like personal debt. Like you start out 19 years old and you get a job and you immediately run to the bank and get a loan so you can get a large green tea or go to the furniture company and get a loan and get a, you know, furniture and go get a loan from, you know, back then Radio Shack and get a TV and, and you get all this, these things all on credit. And then you're paying at the same time, you're paying, you, 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 you do things on, on your credit card, which the bank readily gives you. So you live completely on this debt and with the illusion that you have possessions and have these things, right? And so you go down that path and I was maxed out on all of my, my mortgage, my line of credits, my credit cards, you know, and I had big, big uh, limits on my credit cards. I was maxed out because I was trying to buy hope, you know, I was trying to buy an attraction, attraction quotient in me. I was trying to buy that women would look at me while wow, this guy's arrived. He's got this cool stuff. And, um, so for certainly what's me is change is, is to bat that all the way and go into the simplicity of just being that's changed for me. And the other thing that's changed for me is I don't take anything back then I was taking things seriously. I was really driven. Now I don't take anything seriously. You know, uh, I, I have simple books. I sit in my rocking chair. I think a lot, play a bit of guitar, you know, and it's, it's as big and grand a life as, as there is, I think, you know, mm -hmm. so like, you, you know, with ours and Murata, with, with our, with, you know, we've, we're a, a coaching company, but not really. And I've been doing this for 20 years. I've been doing workshops and men's groups and week long retreats and immersions and year long mastermind. You know, I, I and we've got the group of the Almirati, but we, but it's a very simple affair actually. And it's just really just, gathering around the fire and, and telling the stories of the day as men used to do. And it's just, it's getting into the idea that beauty is uh, missing from the world. And so to reclaim it in relationships, in the face of women, in the face of men, you know, mm -hmm. so it's a, it's a big uh, endeavor, I guess you could say, but a right. simple one. And I do want to uh, talk more about that. But first, you know, there is something that that I found really interesting in one of your uh, talks, I believe it was the the twenty one convention uh, talk that you did, where you were you were discussing how you know men in history, or should I say boys in history, have always always had this rite of passage, right, yeah. from going boys to men, you know, and mm -hmm. now there was never the you know the teenager. It's like a new sort of yeah. modern concept, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm curious, you know, my question to you. Is there any way, you know, can we recreate that sort of thing in modern society? How can, you know, say a guy, you know, in his teens, or early 20s, how can he, he have that rite of passage? Is it possible? Yeah. Hmm. I think what a guy has to do is he has to hit the road. That's the honest truth. You've got you've to go into the wilderness, whatever that is for you, you know, you've got to go into, you've got to hit the road and try and see what you're made of. 
I really think so. You know, like we fall into the automatic college after high school and university, which we follow the, the things that we're interested in and we, and we take up a profession or we fall out of the university into a job and we continue in that. We get another job. We move company to company. We get raises. We get different benefits. We do all this kind of stuff. And we keep going until we get to a point. Like we talked about the guys in their, you know, in their turn 40 and they're like, wait a minute, is this it? You know, what about that love of, of art and creativity that I had as a child, you know? And then they, they break up with their girl, with their, with their wife, or they have tension, you know, in their, in their, 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 with their wife and children. And it falls apart because he's feeling he didn't live something. He didn't experience something. And, and then he tries it. Then he buys the red sports car, gets the young, or tries to get the young, you know, hot uh, bikini model with him, you know, throw his money all around, you know. You don't see and, any of that going on in Miami. No, not at all. <laughs> and uh, so, um, yeah, and so that rite of passage, I, I think honestly, because we don't have this culture in our culture, we don't have a rite of passage anymore. In every, in every culture, in every country, in every race on earth, in every religion, they had a point where the boys would, would have a ritual. A, 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 you know, an, an actual proactive ritual that the men would say, okay, son, you come here, you stand here, we do this. You know, like uh, the, the, the natives would send the, the boy out in a vision quest when he's 12, 13 years old, and he has to go and survive and find his totem and find a spirit animal and go in delirium and hungry and cold and come back and, you know, change, transformed. And they say, now you can stand with the men. And that concept, like, I, like you said earlier, of a teenager didn't exist until about 1950. We never even had the word. If we look up the word on, on Google, you know, like the Google history or whatever it is, it didn't even show up until the 1950s or something like that. There's no such thing as a teenager. It was boys and then men. And so that lack of, of the father energy that says, I'm going to pass on some wisdom to you, son. I'm going to pass on how to whittle, how to make a fire, how to, you know, the great classic books to read that'll, that'll give you some sense of destiny, give you a sense of ancestry and, 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 you know, thought has been, you know, has been coming down to you and you carry that, that traditions forward. We've lost it and like completely lost it. And the West is broken as we all know. And uh, so I, I think the reclamation is you've got to break free from the, what we call, what we would call home. Cause it's not even home anymore in America. You know, it's like a single family or single mother family. Dad's gone metaphorically or really gone. Uh, uh, mother's raises it's sort of. And, you know, we, 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 we have this, well, anyway, I could talk about society all day long, but it's not my, it's not what I talk about, you know? Sure. So, so, so to recreate it, I think because we don't have this handing down spirit, this hand, passing down, taking the communal fire, the tribal fire and handing it down to the, to the younger generation to take that fire and hold it carefully and, and don't let it go out. I think the only thing a young man can do is to hit the road and go completely to the opposite side of the world. And, and see what you're made of. See what you can see, if you can survive, if you can figure things out. Right. Awesome. Yeah. Well, kind of along the same lines, kind of talking about, you know, uh, sort of childhood and growing up. Um, another really interesting thing that, that has really stuck with me, you know, since watching one of these talks you gave is, you know, you, you, you bring up the idea of, you know, people in history never having easy childhoods. Right. You know how we blame a lot of our current issues, you know, as adults on like, you know, childhood traumas, you know, and we sort of make excuses and say, oh, you know, I can't do this. I can't become that because this happened to me. And right. you're sort of like you were sort of like directly attacking that notion of like, well, we've had this, the, our <laughs> childhoods are like the easiest they've ever been. So, yeah, I, I just thought I had never heard that. Uh, said in a way um, in that way before yeah. so I thought that was that was a really fascinating idea well it's the truth I mean like this entire 
volume of our civilization of our, in the West, this entire generation, couple generations maybe, is completely navel-gazing, looking inward, victimized. And my childhood was broken. And I didn't have, and I was abused as a child and I was abandoned and I was hurt. And I was, and, and I had all these things, bad things happened to me. And because of that, I can't function, you know, so I have this excuse. And so I need counseling. I need pills. I need, you know, I need to take all these pills and I've got this, this childhood trauma and I've got PTSD and I've got, uh, you know, all these things. And yet what we never reflect on is, is what I've said, which is there is in all of history in every country and every culture, there's never been happy childhoods that didn't have abuse, abandonment, war, famine, uh, migration, uh, disease, pestilence in all of history. And yet those young people who survived it, we survive way more than we do than we used to, right? Uh, those young people who survived it became, you know, into their 20s and stuff like that. They, they, created, they created civilization. They created cities. They created, they didn't have a nice childhood. Daddy didn't, wasn't there for them. Uh, they were, they saw mother, you know, get killed in front of them because of some invading force into their, you know, and diseases. And, you know, you know, we, 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 th we think we have diseases today, but we're pretty resolved and resolute with our diseases today because we know how to, you know, we, we've understood germ theory. So in all of history, we've never had happy childhoods, but we're the only generation that has to contemplate it and dwell on it and, and use that as an excuse. We have this phrase, which is, a, which is a ridiculous phrase as far as I'm concerned. I we first have to resolve our childhood before we can go on to be productive. And I completely like, I am uh, more and more. I am, I, I'm, I, I feel like we've wasted our generation on self help. So I think, I think it's a waste. The number one genre book in the, out there and Amazon or anywhere is self help books, you know, and it's a waste. And what's so, Interesting and ironic is that the previous podcast I recorded was actually with our, our mutual friend, Nizar. Uh -huh. um, the title of the podcast is Stop Trying to Heal Your Traumas. Basically, oh. a big theme in it was, you know, how he's talking about, you know, now that he's a life coach, you know, working with all of these, you know, clients who are, you know, caught up in all of these past stories and think that in order to get where they want to go, they have to somehow resolve and, and figure out and yeah. go to therapy for all of these past things. And he's kind of telling them like, just go and do that, do whatever you want to do, take the leap into the unknown. And yeah. then those things will sort of resolve themselves. It seems like that's kind of a, maybe a similar sort of. Yeah. Message. And I, I'm not a normal guy. Like I, I'm not a guru and I'm not a spiritual leader at all. Um, I'm just a guy that likes girls and, and transform that love of women and beauty into a message that I share. That's it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, like there's, I've never read a self-help book in my life and not because maybe I don't think there's value in it, but because I just, people give me books as I'm traveling, you know, Zan, this, I, I brought this book for you. I signed it. Or I wrote in it. And I think it'd be really important for you or, or really valuable for you. And I look at the first couple pages, I can't get into it. My self-help, if you want to call it that, has been literature, stories of, of men who went to sea, you know, stories of men who, who left that, that uh, dysfunctional childhood and said, ah, I gotta, <laughs> get, I'm out of here, see, I gotta go. And they go into the wooden ships and go into, into the sea. And that, that would make me think, how can I ever have an excuse if those guys could do it? You know, we have so much safety nets now. People say, oh, I go, I, I went backpacking around Europe for a year. But you went from, from ATM to ATM, you know, and you could always call mom if you got into a sp spot to send you some money. And there's, it was, it was complete safety net, mm -hmm. you know, and you're looking for the same thing you had in America. Where's the, where's the same type of food? Where's the, the you know, the, the restaurants I'm used to and where's the, you know, 
And so you go into this, we say we're, we're traveling, but we're not really, we're just kind of like displacing ourselves in, into another culture with all, everything intact. And we don't, you know, in, in fiction, the, the protagonist has to change somehow, has to transform. Otherwise the story has no, has no wheels. It, it, there's nothing we can relate to in the story. He's got to go through a conflict or some, our journey, you know, the hero's journey, for instance, and he has to transform so that, so that we can see that transformation. And a lot of people will go on a trip. They go on a three week vacation or they go on a six months sabbatical somewhere and they sit and complain about the, 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 the environment they're in, the same as if they were sitting at back at home. They go back home and nothing was transformed. Nothing changed. They didn't, they didn't grow. They didn't, under, they didn't sit and you know, con contemplate their, their role in this time of history, in that culture, and now going back. So, yeah, I could go on about it. But... Yeah, I know. I mean, speaking of like just people, I feel like chasing you know, security and, and safety, one of the, I thought it was hilarious in, in one of the talks you gave, you, you made a joke about, you know, if you want, if you want security, you know, go <laughs> onto the streets of Miami and kill someone, you know, get maximum security, right? Like, why? Yeah, that's great why, security. Great security. <laughs> get all your meals. But I'm, I'm just curious, like, why, like, for me, I mean, I've always had the adventurous, like, that, for me, it's always chasing the fun, chasing the adventure. Why, but why? Why do you feel like as a society, why, why have we gotten so caught up in, in security uh, when it's, we're, we're really the safest we've ever been? We're not, uh, most of us don't face an immediate threat to our lives on a daily basis, you know, maybe besides uh, the, what's going on with COVID right now, but. I don't know, I guess comfort, uh, comfort, you know, breeds weakness, I think, because you don't have to challenge yourself. You, you're, you go into any grocery store in Miami and it's like, it's not like, you know, three or four types of cereal. There's an entire aisle as far as you can see, you know, and it's now you have this abundance of choice and it's full of options. And, um, we have complete, there's a complacency in, in that because we're, 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 we're fatted, you know, we sit around and we're fatted. We have everything, within reach, it's fingertips. And our entertainment is within fingertips. Mm. You know, when I was a kid living in, in, in a log cabin, like in the evening, you, like, you put the kerosene lamp on and there's a, or a little flickering light, a little flickering candle, and what do you do? You sit there, you know? You, just, you sit there or you read uh, or you write, uh that's about it you know <laughs> and and it's and i'm not saying that that's optimal i'm i'm a i'm a technophile i like you know ipads and phones and i like neck technology and i'm a computer whiz or a computer nerd <laughs> mm -hmm. you know and i like this kind of stuff but we have we have such an abundance that we that everything's right there all of the the internet basically has given us the, the world, you know, it's the knowledge of tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you know, for our time. We're right in the middle of Eden and the knowledge of tree, uh, uh, the tree of knowledge of good and evil is right, is the internet. You can find anything good or evil on the internet and it's at our fingertips. And yet we, 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 we complain because we are unfulfilled and dissatisfied, you know? Right. So. Right. So switching gears a little bit, I wanted to ask you, you know, you, you mentioned about, you know, kind of the, the uh, you know, the book, Alabaster Girl, um, you know, kind of, you, you wrote it for uh, your younger self, if I'm uh, not mistaken, or you sort of wish that you had known all of these things, that yeah. you had someone to, to tell you all this stuff when you were, when you were growing up. Yeah. I'm curious, yeah. my question is like, how much how much of your current drive and, and passion for the work that you do sort of stems from sort of maybe, uh, you know, trying to help guys not have to go through, you know, some of the same hardships mm. and, and struggles. Is, is that a big sort of part of your mission? <sighs> not really. I thought it was. Interesting. Yeah, but I thought it was, you know, I thought it was like, 
but I had a podcast with Jordan j- just a couple of days ago and we talked about motivation and what motivates us and what is meaning. And, uh, and there was a, a challenge brought up in that conversation to some degree, which I'm still contemplating. I don't know what it is, but is it really for my young self? Is it really for other men who, so they don't have to go through something? Because I asked Jordan, hey, what's his motivation? Why? What's Nizar's motive? What's your motivation for doing this podcast? So, you know, like what, why? And, it, and we, I don't think we've examined it. We think we can, we nod our head and say, well, because I'd like to, you know, share this, make the world a better place. Or, you know, um, um, I have all these things that we say, but why? This is my question I asked Jordan. I said, you know, he's traveled the world since he was 19, 20 years, seeking out teachers and understanding and learning. And he's, he's become this, this force of nature. And the question I asked him is, is why? What, what is the motivation? Because you want to save the world? Uh, not really, you know? Is it because, is, I, I guess I'm sitting in this question of, of, of the motivation of it all and why and why do we do it because we could for instance talking about these are in the third party again these are close your ears we're talking about you you're going to get an itch right now um he you know when i talked to him lots of times in miami all he wanted to do was go down this path of understanding this enlightenment energy like he's a very scientific guy and he's and he loves the idea that of the atomic energy that flows, you know, and, and, and we had many conversations about this and now he's, he's, he's a doctor, but his, his whole desire was to go and share as a, as a, like, as you said, a life coach, which he's doing now. And there's some burning in him that is, that has to be fulfilled for that. You know, he, ha- he feels like this, the doctor's okay. You can make money, get a nice house and, you know, this kind of stuff, but he, there's something that doesn't, scratch the itch in him you know so and but he could he could instead of turning and sharing it to others jordan could you could i could we could absorb and learn and travel and take our experiences and sit at the feet of others and, and absorb uh different different uh thoughts and experiences and, and mysticisms etc and absorb it into us and become a better person and become a better energy and become a better knowledgeable without passing it on right we could just say wow i learned a lot about women i get it Uh, i'm good and 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 live your life but there's some burning in us to take that what we've learned to pass it on to our metaphorical young self maybe to other young men who did you know and and that fascinates me i want to know about motivation so that's what i'm sitting in i guess is my long yeah answer but why 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 are you so driven to do this podcast you're excited to do it you can tell you're excited you know for me a lot of it stemmed from i mean i've always loved i've always been the curious person who's always asking a million questions to and i always want to talk to people i always seek out you know whatever it is that i'm interested in i try to find the top person you know the top expert yeah who i can speak to and really, you know, in certain ways, the podcast is a nice excuse to, to have certain conversations with people who <laughs> otherwise I might not have had a chance. That's to true. Have. For instance, like if, I, you know, I'm a nerd, if I read some kind of cool uh, neuroscience <laughs> paper from some guy, some professor at Stanford, you know, if I call that guy up and be like, hey, I wanted to ask you some questions about this, probably not going to respond. If I say, hey, I'd love to have you on the show. Uh, that's I'm true. Gonna, that's you true. Know, so it's like partly out of selfish uh, reasons but but also giving you know others the platform to to share you know their incredible work so but also it's like i can't say for sure that's the that's what i say is yeah. my reasoning for the yeah, podcast yeah. but there's probably a million different reasons like yeah who knows i and can't like, pin I, it down I, i'm fascinated by it you know like i, I want to know I like, i'm very yeah. curious about that our motivation like you yeah. said two things that motivate you which is you get to have this great conversation that you would love to have, which is a beautiful motivation. The second motivation is you get to have that person be able to share his work a bit more broad, right? Mm-hmm. And that's my question. 
why is that important to the heart of Toby? Incredible, huh? Mm. Very. I'll have to, I'll uh, yeah, it's, that. it is important. It is important. But why yeah. is that so important that you can get this uh, uh, somebody else's voice and message and pass it to others? What internal thing is that is is fulfilled? It, it it's it's there's something, and I just don't think we think on it. Uh, we think oh, we say a lot of abstractions and mission statements. I you know to be all they can be to 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 you know we we say all kinds of platitudes of of why and you know motivational uh phrases because i want to bring hope to the world and you know yeah just cookie what, is it, what does it do in our gut made. when we go to sleep at night what do we think i did that mm -hmm. legacy you know maybe leaving something yeah. behind yeah i mean i'm not sure i'm gonna have to ponder exactly that. exactly yeah. <laughs> it's a tough question i ask this of everybody like i, I like i sit at the feet of uh, you know, I, I visited in the last few years some, some pretty well-known people who are who are thought leaders and influencers in philosophy and stuff like that. And I'm asking, wrote 40 books, for instance. And why did you write 40 books? What was in it that, you know, I want to know. And they can't answer it. They can say, they can ask, answer around it. Well, because it was, I had to write and had to, you know, but it, what, you know, anyway, wow. Yeah. Well, listen, I want to switch gears a little bit. Um, sure. You know, you seem to have a, a pretty damn good understanding of, of sort of the, the psychology of women or, or you've, you've sort of, you know, basically, I think you've said sort of been, you know, sat at the, you know, kneeled, you yeah. know, and learned everything that you can, right, from women. Yeah. I'm curious, you know, what, what do you think the biggest, uh, the biggest sort of misconceptions that that most men have, you know, about women or the way their brains work. What, what have you learned that, that is sort of contrary to what most guys think? Well, one thing for sure is that we, that our impression of women is that they have it together and we don't, that they are beautiful, that they um, must have confidence and it's the us that is lacking confidence. And we, and, and when you realize that women are in their heads just as much as men and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get up our nerve and go talk to a girl and we'll say, uh, so how long have you lived here and blah, blah, blah. We're trying to keep a conversation going, which is really difficult for us. And she's going, yes, mm -hmm, no, uh -huh, uh, like just simple one word answers. We think we're not, well, I'm not dynamic. I'm not interesting. I'm not engaging her on a, on a emotional level. I'm failing at this conversation. And we second guess it, you know, quarterback at the next day sort of thing. And we never think that she's saying one word, simple answers, because she's nervous and in her head. That never crosses the mind, men. When you say it to them, what? How, how, look at her. She's a beauty. How can that be? Look at me compared to her. How can, they're almost offended and saying, you know, how can she be, there's no way she has lack of confidence. Look at her. You know? And, mm -hmm. and it's a misconception men have. The other misconception is, Women are far more sexually minded than than we could possibly imagine. They're they're far more uh, um, th they are far more sexually minded. They're thinking about sex all the time, but they hide it and they and they and they uh, they they mask it and they are completely one hundred percent thinking in these terms all the time more more so than men, I think. And is you that know? because society deems it inappropriate for them? Well, to... no. Well, yeah, because they're judged, you know, the, because they're the judged. Thing, yeah, because men are not judged. You know, you can go like have like 14 girlfriends. Yeah, that's, that's Toby, you know, it's just that guy, right? The women and the men all think the same thing. It's like, well, that's, that's, but if a girl, girl has 14 guys, she has to worry about that reputation. She has to worry about it because men and women will judge her. You know, we, women understand and they go, uh-huh, but they'll judge her anyway because women are just evil to women. But men will judge her. I don't know, what, what's with this girl? You know, like she had 14 guys in one year or whatever it is, right? And, and, and so men are petty that way and they will judge a woman who wants to express herself in a, in a sensual, sexual, artistic way, you know? And so women have to disguise it, have to mask it, have to downplay it 
have to be completely, you know, you have to date her three times and you have to, uh, she doesn't want to be look like she's easy and she doesn't want to look like she's uh, too available and too eager because, because she has learned from men, from men that uh, they dismiss her because she's, she's too easy and too available and they judge her and judge to be judgmental of someone like that is the worst quality you can have men or women, you know? Right. I was wondering if you could elaborate on, on another concept um, in your book, you talk about, uh, you know, guys making the mistake that, you know, they think they, that they should not uh, compliment, you know, a beautiful uh, girl, mm -hmm. a beautiful woman, you know, cause she's so used to that, you know, and, and getting a million compliments thrown at her. They don't want to, you know, try to put her on a pedestal, but you sort of dispel that, that notion in the book. Mm -hmm. Can you sort of talk about that? Yeah, because, a, because a compliment that you're talking about and what from 99% of men, the compliment is all, it has nothing to do with her. It's all about me. I'm going to give you a compliment so that I hope that you give me something in return so that you like me. I'm going to say, wow, you have beautiful eyes. Uh, which she's heard all her life, right? Mm -hmm. She's heard that all, wow, your, your eyes are so beautiful. And so it's she dismisses it. She, it's conditional. It's like, I hope you re receive that and give me something in return. Like, allow me to continue to talk to you, give me your number, go to bed with me, uh, you know, have dinner with me. We're looking for something in return from a compliment. But a compliment that comes from a sense of um, grounded masculinity has no sense of, of asking anything in return. It's like a king, a king walking through his kingdom. And he's walking with his entourage to the kingdom. And he sees a young girl over there. And he's never seen her before. And what would, what would he do? He would say, stop, everyone, stop. Young girl who I've never seen before, please step here, come here. I have never seen you before. I'm pleased to see you. I'm happy that you are in my kingdom and I, and, I, and I see you. And you have beautiful eyes. You see, there's a boom, boom. There's a thrusting energy to that, which is compassionate and kind, pure, confident. There's no neediness in that. You're, there's dating coaches out there that teach, oh, you can't tell a woman she's beautiful because... You know, you have to pretend you're aloof and have options and she's, you know, and, and you're not interested. You have to be this kind of, otherwise you look needy. But there's no neediness in this energy of saying, you know what, I've seen some things in my life. I'm standing on this earth and I see you now for the first time. And I want to say, wow, you are beautiful. And you have beautiful eyes. She's heard that her whole life, but she's never heard it from this because it's a one way. It's a, that compliment goes from here to there. It's because... I'm the king. I'm going to say this to you. This is what I'm going to do. You can do what you want with it. So it's like a one-way thing. There's no uh, expectation that, oh, I hope you like me, and can I hang around you, and can I join you? There's none of that. She can invite that, and, you, and, and there's, a, there's a great movement forward to that because you have desire. Desire is not neediness, you know? But there's something that just it's, it lands. It's a, it's a statement. There's no question in it. Uh, can I buy you a drink? Uh, can I have your phone number? There's no question. It's just like, I want to say this to you because I'm the king. Uh, you are beautiful to me. And I just met you. And it, that lands. That's a ball hitting under her side of the court. You know, she can do what she, whatever she wants. So that she can pick up the ball, hit it back. She can walk off the court. She can turn around and ignore you. None of that, none of that negates the fact that you spoke what you know to be true, which is I know to be true that that's a girl I've never seen. That's the truth. Number two, she's in the shape of a girl that I like. It's my type. You know, number three, I like her face and her hair and her eyes. I, that's true. These are all truths. Number four, I would like to say something to her. That's the truth. Number five, I say to her, you are a beauty. That's the truth. There's nothing in there that can be negated. She can't reject that. She can't say, no, I, 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 I disagree because this is, you're only speaking, you know, what you know to be true. That kind of a compliment never lands flat is completely different energy than she's ever heard of before. And she'll never forget it. So 
when when you give a woman a compliment like this is she just completely caught off guard as far as the lack of could be anything she could be a married woman you don't know right you just don't know she could be not single at all she could be nervous she could be anything but what you will get but that's not the concern the concern is and and you're not going to get the same response from every woman you know but i promise you if, if you say that to a married woman, you don't know she's married and you say, you know what, I have to stop you for a second. I want to say this to you. You have beautiful eyes. I just want to say this to you, that phrase, you know, I'm going to say this to you. I'm stopping you here and I have to say this to you. You, my dear, have beautiful eyes. There's a statement, boom, 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 boom. She could be married, engaged, uh, in boyfriend, uh, single, but she will feel respectedly, respected and seen. So somebody said this, you know, and I know this goes against the, the entire me too, like, you know, whatever, but oh, well, I don't, that's not my concern. You know, like I, I'm talking about ancient uh, dynamics and a dance between men and women that's going on forever. And it's, and it's a good thing. So um, her response, I guess you could say is irrelevant because you've done your job as a man. You stood on this earth mm -hmm. and said, I like beautiful things. You look like a beautiful thing. You've done your job. You you stood up. You've done you've you've mastered your domain in that moment. Now she can, uh, and of course you'd like to have her number. There's there's desire is beautiful. Neediness is not. Mm -hmm. Entitlement is not. Uh, well, I said some nice thing to you. I tried to buy you a drink, and now you're just like flaky. You flaky girl. You know that's entitled. Uh, uh, victim weak men the king's saying you know i'm moving to my kingdom there's something about you i like and i want to say that i want to say that and i did boom now whatever the response is she could be completely flustered or nervous or excited or smile or respond or ask your name whatever whatever the response is that's a complete next that's the next field of study you know right and that that seems to be a big theme in in your work as far as just kind of s like sending out these invitations yeah that, you know bas basically speaking your truth hitting the ball into her court you know and then it's yeah. no longer necessarily all uh, uh, up to you it's you know it's an invitation sure. to dance you know it's like it's like you know when when you're dancing with a woman you know and you're going to spin the, the concept of spinning her around right the men's leading the dance and she's She's being guided in this and she's, she's the one everybody's looking at. Nobody's looking at you. Nobody's looking at you standing there with your hand up trying to spin this girl around. They're looking at the girl and the way her dress flows around her stuff. That's the role of, a, of the king of that man to say, what a beauty. Everyone look at this beauty because I'm going to make her shine and I'm going to lift my hand. And it isn't, it isn't taking her by the hand and grinding her, spinning her around like this. It's holding up her hand like this. It, it, you know, and, and, and having her have the ability to step into it and, 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 and twirl on her own. It's not movement. It's not doing this and dragging it around. It's giving her the chance to shine. And that's what it is. So um, there is no, there's no, um, there's nothing you're doing. You, it's an invitation. It's a pure invitation to, to be beautiful and shine in my presence. I'll hold up my hand. No one's going to look at me. I want everybody to look at you. What a beauty you are. And that's the spirit of it. It's like an invitation of, uh, at, you give that strong invitation and you let her have full autonomy. I'm never invasive. Like, I, like I'm not this kind of, like, um, I, I don't ever invade a woman's space. I don't ever presume that I can sit down at her table or I, I only look for, you know, for, for, for her invitation. You know, I, I initiate. But if I feel if I feel like it's like well I'm not invited then I I don't uh, I don't invade space. You should never be invasive. Does this play into the concept of of empathy that you talk a lot about in the book? As well, I think so. Yeah, because if you don't have empathy for the plight of yourself, like your role and your journey, and you don't have empathy for for her. You don't have empathy for the women that you encounter and what they're trying to understand and expect, you know, trying to create in their life too. And you want to, and if, if you can see them on that level, that they're, 
that they're, they're sweet and trying to figure out life just like you are, you know, mm -hmm. then you can look at them with, with eyes that says that, that feels like it, I'm on the same journey and I get that you're on that journey too. So the empathy is, is no one is unincluded in the energy of you. Mm -hmm. You see right. what I mean? It's like, it's like if I'm at a, at a party or a restaurant table and I see you there and no one's talking to you. Everyone's kind of like laughing and joking and maybe paired off or something. And you're sitting by yourself and no one's talking to you. I can't, that can't abide. <laughs> I, that is something that I will stop whatever is happening in my, I will stop myself. I'm having a conversation here, laughing, telling, telling jokes. I will stop at midway. Say, Toby, Toby, did you, did you meet this girl? Come in here, get, get your energy into the, the energy is always going to go into the center. And I think it's maybe because I was not included when I was, mm. when I was young, you know, I was the last one picked on the team. I was a little, you know, chess playing bookworm nerd, you know? And, um, and so I can't, that's something I can't abide in, in, in my presence, you know, whatever that means. I, I will not let anybody be not seen. So that means like, here's a girl you're really attracted to. And here's some girls you're not really attracted to. And most guys look at these girls and blank them out. Just they're doing the same thing that they complain that women are doing to them. Oh, she re you know, rejects me. They look at her. I'm not, well, I'm not attracted to them. So, and then they try and smile and turn it on for this girl that they're attracted to. That's a failing. That's a failure, you know? So it's like that energy is given equally in, in grand doses to all. They're all invited into this presence of let's celebrate into the center here and nobody's unincluded. And it's such an interesting sort of perspective or, or kind of way, to, uh, just a yeah, unique way to go about life. Cause you know, you talked about in the book, you know, kind of how most guys, you know, they go out and it's sort of, you know, every, every man for themselves. Right. You know, where as far as like women, yeah. you're, you're talking about, it's more so, you know, the, the sort of herd, they, they protect you know, each Deck other, herd, yeah. right? Right. But you're sort of almost now, um, I don't know. It, it seems like you're just kind of trying to raise up the energy as far as just getting every, you well, know. Well, yeah, because we talked about motivation earlier. Like my, I just, I know what it feels like to be shunted aside and marginalized. I know what it's like to not be seen, to be invisible. And I just, and I won't allow it around me. And I think if I've, and I've studied the lives of men who have abundance of women in their life, you know, from Casanova on, you know, I, I've studied it, everything, everything. And the quality they have is a general, one quality they have is a generosity of spirit, which is the opposite of being judgmental. Well, I don't like that girl because, uh, you know, mm -hmm. what she's wearing or whatever. So they have a real generosity of spirit. They want everybody to see what they see, to see the, with the eyes that they see through because what wonder and magnificence there is to be seen. And they want others to, to see that too because they feel fulfilled, talking about our motivation earlier, when they can see the eyes and face light up of someone else, of a girl or other guys who feel like they're included. You don't feel like they're 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 val they're valued and they are seen. So um that that's empathy, I guess you could say. Right. So Zan, what's next for you? Because I'm <laughs> I'm curious, you are you working on another book? I'm in my studio. I rented a a studio apartment, which is where I'm at right now. A three minute walk away from my regular apartment where I live and I have it set up with a rocking chair, uh, paper strewn around books. Um, and I'm working on a second book and I'm, I'm having a real struggle with it in, in that I know what it's about and I know, and I've got 50,000 words of notes and I know how I want it to feel and getting the, 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 well, the Alabaster Girl took me 10 years to write because, you know, I think art has always been a compromise or a balance between 
content and the form. So you could take the Alabaster Girl book, it's 400 pages, you could chop 100 pages off of it by just getting the simple message portrayed. But there's a musicality that had to be in the book too, in my mind, to, for me to like it. You know, to, for me, it's something I want to read. It had to have this sing-song rhythm, rhythmic musicality to match the content so that the, the content um, is, in, is described by the way it's written, by the form of it. And so the second book I'm trying to write, uh, I, it's not the content I'm showing, it's the form. And I look at it and I look at stuff I've written in the last days and I'm, I look at it and I think it's just crap, you know? But if I sit and keep swearing at it and looking at it and, and, and being disgusted, something will come out of it. <laughs> Is there anything yeah, it's that... It's easy for me to write. Right. Is there anything that you can tell us yet about just the, the idea or the, the sort of... Well, I'm writing about... Book? Well, no, because... I mean, this is part of the reason I'm having a hard time writing it is because I know what it's about, but I don't know what it's about, I think. And my first book was about beauty, how we're missing beauty in relationships, right? It was all about men and women, realistically. But it was really about life and a, a life of adventure and a life of, of meaning and relevance, to have a life that is a relevant life. So when you're old, you can look back and say, I don't know what it meant, but I, I did that and I did that and I did that and I did that and I did that. You know, at least I tried, at least I did my, my best and now I'm going to die. Right. So this book is a, is a furtherance of that. Um, more abstract, I think like the entire conversation of men and women, which is, which defined my life since I was a, a teenager, I did nothing. I did 10,000 hours trying to, you know, going out into bars. I did 10,000 hours trying to understand the hearts and minds of women. More than anybody I know, I've done nothing but try and understand that, that, you know, the dance of men and women. And, and I put it all into the Alabaster Girl. And now that conversation for me is done. Like that conversation has, has, is, is, has been compartmentalized and boxed up, put a bow on it, and I put it over there. It's put aside. The next thing is the furtherance of that conversation, but it's not necessarily specific to men and women. It's more specific to uh, the concept of beauty and art and the creative spirit, you know, things that, that we've talked about, things that I've talked about with Nizar too, which is the new science of, you know, neuroscience and, and, and physics and, and quantum attraction and stuff like that and quantum entanglement. I think it's, and I don't know anything about these things. I'm trying to write about these things. I have no clue, <laughs> you know, but I'm writing a very abstract book, I think, which is more of a, a contemplation. I guess that's it. With no answers, because I don't know. <laughs> but it's so hard. I'm really struggling with the, with the shape and form of it. And I'm like, but I'll get it. Well, whenever you do, I'll be, I'll be anxiously, <laughs> eagerly awaiting it. So. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> People right say, I can't up. wait to read it. I can't wait to read it either. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Zan, I've had so much, uh, so much fun having you on the show today. Um, tell, tell all our listeners, you know, if, if they enjoyed our conversation, where can they find out more about your work, uh, you know, and find your book? Okay. Well, they can get my book at alabastergirl.com. I give it away for free. I, I sign copies here in Romania and we ship them in the mail. In a few weeks or a couple of weeks, you'll have a, a signed copy of me. And, and all you have to do, it's free. You just have to pay for the shipping and handling, just 10 bucks. And I actually, I think I lose a dollar on a book. <laughs> I just did the math the other day with Serena. I'm like, wait a minute, I'm losing money on these. Anyway, I give the book away. You cover the cost of the book and the, and the envelope and the shipping. And I'll sign it, send it to you. Alabastergirl.com. Uh, my main website is arsamorata.com. A-R-S-A-M-O-R-A-T-A.com. And for the, the few guys who were called to this message and called to something as we run a, an online class twice a year. We're opening one, well, I don't know when this video is gonna go up, but we're opening one at the beginning of the next week or the end of next week uh, class, and it's a 90 day class. And, and when you graduate from that, you become a member of our men's group, which we have members in you know, 30 countries around the world, uh, called the Amirati 
which is another fake la world we in word we <laughs> invented. If you want to join that, you go to amorati.net, A-M-O-R-A-T-I.net. If the class is closed, put your name on the waiting list and you'll get early bird access to the next class when it opens. And we've got a great brotherhood and we have, um, we've, we have conferences twice a year. Men come from all over the world. The last one we did was in Valencia, Spain, or, or Bucharest. I think we did last one in Bucharest and we had like, you know, 80 guys from, come from around the world. So we have a good brotherhood. You know, it, there's, a, it, there's a lot of people that have been friends and, and members of the Amirati for more than 10 years. There's about 30 guys that have the, the Amirati logo tattooed on their body somewhere, you know, not because of any other reason than it, they feel they, they belong to something, you know. So if you're interested in that, if you're, if you're a guy and you want to sit in this great conversation, go to Amirati.net and join, join the Amirati. Incredible. We have live calls every month and it's fun. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Zan, you know, before we wrap up, I just have to tell you, you know, you may not know, but just the, the influence that you've had, you know, just since Nizar, you know, introduced me to your work, I, you know, just have nothing but, you know, gratitude for, for everything that you're doing. And, uh, you know, I really thank you. It's thank you for been that. amazing nice. to, yeah, it's been amazing to, to be able to actually get to speak to you and, ask the questions that I've been curious about <laughs> from, from reading the book. That's very kind. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, for our yeah. listeners, if you enjoyed the show today, uh, go ahead and like, and subscribe uh, to our YouTube channel. We are Roscoe's wetsuit. Uh, you can also find audio version, uh, an audio version of the podcast on Apple podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. So go ahead, check us out any way you want. Zan again, thanks so much for coming on today. Thank you for having me, Toby. Absolutely. All right, let me just stop recording.